mute. Yeah, this is okay. Yeah, okay. uh, let me let me just make it a bit. Uh,
Hello and welcome to this Africa media briefing for the World Health Organization Africa. My name is Adrian Monk here at the World Economic Forum in Geneva. I'm joined by my colleague, Peter Vanham, uh, pour les auditeurs en français. Uh, and we're about to uh, talk with uh, Dr. Machadiso Mweti, her colleagues, Dr. Yoti and Dr. Yao in Brazzaville, Congo, and also delighted to be joined from Johannesburg by Lola Castro from the World Food Programme. So delighted to have you all here and to take questions. We're going to start in Johannesburg, if we can, with Cara Anna from the Associated Press. So we're just going to uh, get Cara on the line and have her put her question to our uh, panel. Hi, yes, can you hear me clearly? We can. Great, thank you. Um, uh, actually, this is a question I also asked the Africa CDC this morning. Have you begun to see any clusters of flu-like or pneumonia-like illnesses in Africa? And if so, uh, where? Thanks. Dr. Moeti, maybe you could uh, take that with your colleagues. Okay, we just need you to unmute your audio there. Thank you. Okay, is that this one? Perfect. Thank you. So good morning and good morning to all the colleagues, journalists, and, and I'm also very pleased that Lola could join us from the World Food Program. Um, we are not starting to see clusters of flu-like illness yet in our influenza surveillance, as far as I know, but um, it, this is something that we think um, we were expecting to see if indeed uh, the, the, there was some correlation between that and the COVID-19. So we're not yet starting to see this. We have a, a surveillance system for um, influenza in now over 25 countries, I believe. Uh, so we should be able to pick up. We're expecting, of course, the flu season to kick in, especially in Southern African countries and expecting them to start seeing more cases. But as far as I know from my colleagues, not yet. Thank you. Um, turning to um, Joe Bavia, who's Africa business correspondent with Thomson Reuters. Joe, you have two questions, I think. Just checking that we can hear from you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Um, yeah. So I was just, uh, my, my questions are, are related. Um, the, the first question is, I mean, we, in Africa, we have seen uh, relatively few uh, governments introduce the kind of lockdown measures that we've seen uh, in, in China, in Asia, and now in Europe that uh, experts are saying have been, in, been effective in flattening the, the curve. Um, I wanted to ask about um, what are the kinds of economic um, restrictions, perhaps, that are influencing those decisions. What make uh, what makes that kind of less um, practical in the African context? And in uh, related to that question, um, the fact that African governments aren't uh, introducing such strict measures. What kind of impact is that likely to have on efforts to uh, combat the, the pandemic in Africa and by extension um, in the world? Thanks, Joe. And um, that for Dr. Moeti and perhaps bringing in, bring in your colleagues as well on, on those questions. Uh, yes, thanks for that uh, very good question. Actually, we're seeing an increasing number of African governments impose these uh, physical distancing measures right up to locking down countries. We have, uh, for example, well, of course, we have South Africa, which is the country with the largest number of cases. Botswana has just announced something. Uh, in Nigeria, there's uh, a lockdown of uh, Abuja and Lagos. In the Congo, where we are sitting since yesterday, there are restrictions of movements. There's a curfew that has been put in place. So this is expanding as far as countries are concerned. The economic impact is a great uh, concern. 
the potential economic impact is a great concern and requires that governments should then put in place mitigation measures in order, for example, for people at the lowest socioeconomic levels not to suffer uh, unduly from the fact that, um, for example, many of them work in the informal sector of the economy and uh, do not have formal employment. Some of the people are working as market stall holders and need to earn their living, earn some money every day in order to be able to put food on the table. So these are some of the concerns. Many countries have closed schools already and uh, my colleagues in UNICEF tells us, tell us that uh, hundreds of millions of children are already not going to school in Africa. I think it's a very challenging need to balance the feasibility of some of these uh, physical distancing measures in contexts where uh, people, families live in very small spaces, they have very communal types of lives and, and actually uh, literally physical distancing within the house might be quite a challenge. These are some of the considerations that we've seen in some countries that have imposed these measures where people find it very difficult to stay indoors. It, it is hot, the space is very small, the numbers of people is large. And, um, but at the same time, then the countries are also having to try whatever they can to achieve the social distancing, especially in the early phases of uh, the pandemic or of transmission in these countries where before you start getting very wide generalized transmission. So we think this need to, needs to be assessed in the context of each and every country. It is a good thing that countries are making the attempt to uh, take advantage of these measures. But if actions are taken, these need to be very much be accompanied by mitigation measures of many types. First, to ensure that they are feasible. So for example, in places where people do not have running water in the house, where water is scarce, we need to have governments take that into account and ensure that they are providing water. Then this is, this is a practical uh, measure for people to implement or providing the type of alcohol-based uh, uh, solutions that will make this feasible. So my conclusion is that physical distancing is a very important component of uh, controlling this, this virus. We've seen it applied in contexts which are quite different from in Africa and where it is being applied in Africa, there needs to be very careful, thoughtful analysis and urgent putting in place mitigation measures to make sure that these measures are feasible for the population and people who are vulnerable don't suffer unduly. And I'm sure that uh, Lola could add something here about uh, the risk to people being able to have their nutritional, daily nutritional needs met under these lockdown contexts. Lola. Yeah, effectively. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. I think you, you explain a lot of the challenges we may have during lockdowns. But uh, let me tell you how how do we see the situation from the food security perspective? Of course, we have the urban populations and the rural populations, which in this, uh, in this moment, they, they need to be looked differently in, in relation to how we approach their food security. In, in the, in normally in Southern Africa, in the normal year, we have between 20 to 45 million people who are already food insecure related to climatic shocks or other issues. But uh, at this moment, what uh, we are seeing is that the additional um, impact of COVID locks down or, or maybe even the situation that governments uh, will need to reduce the movement of people and transport may affect us very, very much. And what we are trying, the message for us is like, look, make sure that your most vulnerable are supported, especially the undernourished children, the people with HIV AIDS, uh, the, the people who gain their bread every day. Uh, they need to be supported in one way or another. And, um, and uh, the governments are putting measures in different countries for that. And, and we as United Nations, as Dr. Moeti said, we're also working with them. Uh, the, other, the other, I think, very important point here is um, the, the issue of uh, maintaining the trade, the markets functioning and the trade because uh, in Southern Africa, we have eight of the 12 countries where WFP has presence, where they are basically low income and food insecure countries. So we really need to keep the food moving 
moving in across the region from the producing countries to the others to avoid more food insecurity. And uh, the children, the children at the school, now the children are not going at the school. Many children get their only, a school, only meal a day in the schools, the school meals. And for example, World Food Program works with the governments with 2.8 million children across Southern Africa to receive a school meals. Now we're trying to find solutions, how to do that in a different way. Let me leave it here for potential more questions. Thank you. Merci, uh, Madame Castro. Et on veut, voudrait aussi uh, poser cette, cette même question uh, en français, notamment uh, la, la question sur les mesures de confinement qui sont mises en place maintenant uh, des, pays, des pays francophones aussi uh, en Afrique et uh, l'impact uh, que ça, cela a sur uh, non, non seulement la santé publique, évidemment, mais aussi uh, la situation socio-économique. Uh, Docteur Machidiso Moet. Pouvez-vous aussi euh, nous donner la résumé en français Oui, euh, effectivement, nous voyons de plus en plus les, les, les gouvernements africains mettre sur place ces mesures de confinement, comme ça, ça, ça s'appelait, euh, commençant par euh, le vol. Les vols internationaux sont presque, euh, comme on dit, euh, interdits dans, dans beaucoup de pays. Et, en ce qui concerne le mouvement des personnes euh, de, façon, euh, de façon normale, il y a dans de plus en plus dans des pays des de, de, de mesures de distance physique qui sont en train d'être mises sur place, que les personnes ne peuvent pas sortir de leur maison ou bien la sortie est limitée au groupe essentiel, aux travailleurs essentiels et le, le, la façon d'utiliser le transport aussi est limitée. C'est une possibilité de diminuer la transmission du virus, mais dans le contexte africain, il y a beaucoup de défis qui doivent être pris en compte euh, au cours de la mise en place de, de, de ces mesures. Nous, nous pensons surtout euh, de la possibilité même de, de rester à la maison, dans des petites maisons où nous n'avons pas assez de la place pour tout le nombre de familles que nous avons donc beaucoup dans nos, nos contextes africains. Ça, c'est un grand défi euh, physiquement difficile. Nous devons, euh, ça doit être pris en compte si, si le gouvernement euh, décide de mettre sur place ces mesures. Il y a aussi du fait que la plupart des travailleurs africains sont dans le, le secteur informel des économies. Donc, ils n'ont pas un emploi régulier. Ils doivent sortir, ils doivent travailler chaque jour pour gagner leur vie, pour être capables d'acheter la nourriture pour leur famille de façon quotidienne presque. Donc, s'ils ne peuvent pas sortir, c'est un grand défi pour eux. Donc, selon nous, le gouvernement doit analyser tous ces, ces contextes, ces défis et mettre sur place des mesures qui peut faire face à ces impacts non planifiés des mesures de confinement. Et je, 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 je pense surtout de l'accès à la nourriture pour la population, surtout le groupe le plus vulnérable. Et je crois que mon collègue, Mme Castro, peut s'adresser à cette, cette volet. D'accord. Mme Castro on... Oui, merci beaucoup. Um, Excusez-moi, mon français peut-être un peu rougi, mais quand même, je vais essayer mon mieux. Um, disons, et la situation, comme on a dit, dans, dans l'Afrique australe et, ou l'Afrique en général, c'est que la situation de sécurité alimentaire, c'est en général un peu compliqué déjà au raison des les, les changements climatiques, entre les autres choses. Par exemple, dans dans l'Afrique australe, on a vu dans les, deux, dans les troisième année passée, on a vu des situations de sécheresse, des situations de cyclones qui ont, de, qui ont déjà eh, laissé beaucoup de gens en insécurité alimentaire. Et maintenant, avec eh, toutes ces mesures qui sont en train de se prendre dans la région, on voit que aussi les régions, les, 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 les villes, ils sont aussi affectées par des insécurités alimentaires, surtout comme le docteur Moët, il a très bien dit, les personnes qui sont les plus vulnérables, c'est lui qui travaille chaque jour pour gagner l'accès à la nourriture. Et c'est pour ça qu'on doit vraiment, quand on prend des mesures contre le COVID, 
faire attention aux groupes plus, plus vulnérables et surtout des groupes qui sont déjà en vulnérabilité et en sécurité alimentaire. Disons, on doit prendre des données de subsidies, penser aux, aux enfants qui sont à l'école, qui ne reçoivent plus le, la nourriture de chaque jour qu'ils reçoivent à l'école. On doit penser aux, aux groupes vulnérables mal nourris déjà, comment on va ajouter des, des solutions et aussi éviter qu'ils vont se détériorer parce que j'imagine que le virus, il va être beaucoup plus, avoir beaucoup plus de facilité de se répandir si on a des populations qui sont vulnérables, plus vulnérables. Ils sont importants aussi, l'importance, c'est incroyable l'importance de maintenir le système d'alimentation qui marche. Ils sont la production, les, les, les transports de nourriture dans les régions et aussi les frontières ouvertes, les ports ouverts pour euh, éviter qu'il y ait un manque de nourriture dans les mar marchés et qu'il y ait une inflation des prix aussi. Merci. Merci. And uh, we have some questions already in specifically uh, to Madame Castro. So uh, we'll, we'll come to you in a moment with some of those questions. I want to turn first though uh, to uh, the Mail and Guardian and to Simon Allison, who's uh, on the line. Simon. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, South Africa's rates of new infections appear to have slowed. Does this mean that the national lockdown is working or is it too early to make those kinds of assessments? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Murti, uh, is that something you and your colleagues have been uh, noting um, with uh, uh, with uh, enthusiasm that this appears to be something that's uh, that's working properly and is helping to alleviate the situation in South Africa, or is it too early to uh, to say? Yes, uh, I believe it's too early to say. The, the lockdown has been in place for a few days, and. Um, I think that uh, in infections that would start, transmission that would start to, to be slowed down by the, the lockdown would only show itself in the reduction of cases some days from now, not, not yet in my view. We do also know that there had been an accumulation, a kind of backlog of tests that needed confirming in, in the system in South Africa. So perhaps some of the, some of the dramatic uh, recent uh, increase might have been due to the confirmations coming in a, in a group, so to speak, not spread out since there were some delays initially in finalizing and carrying out the tests. South Africa had to carry the burden initially of confirming the tests of a number of surrounding countries that had to spend, send specimens there. So we believe they, they face that challenge in terms of initial capacity. So I think we need to wait a while before we can come to such a conclusion. Thank you. Um... Turning to uh, McDonald Zirutwe from Zimbabwe, from Reuters, who's on the line. Uh, McDonald, you have a question for the World Food Programme. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So uh, my, my first question uh, is uh, to the World Food Programme. Um, most countries obviously have imposed, uh, you know, these, these, these lockdowns. Um, and... Uh, my question is, will this not affect the movement of food aid, especially in Southern Africa, um, you know, to, to, to needy communities? And uh, what is WFP doing to ensure that, uh, you know, they overcome any uh, logistical issues uh, that may be arising due to the closures of, uh, of borders? And uh, the, the second one is uh, for the WHO, um, you know, whether, they, whether and how are they helping African nations to uh, ramp up testing, you know, for, for, for coronavirus, which is a big issue, obviously, for most countries and may account for the uh, low numbers uh, of uh, official infection, infections. Uh, if you look at Zimbabwe, for example, uh, they've only been able to test uh, less than 300, uh, which is a great concern to, to, to many people. Thank you. Thanks, McDonald. Perhaps we can turn Lola first to you for that question regarding yeah, the no. work. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this, um, it is uh, extremely important that, uh, as I said before, that the food systems continue functioning and not only continue functioning in the countries, like for example, I'm sitting in Johannesburg in South Africa, but also that they are able to 
continue moving across the borders. Um, let me tell you that uh, the World Food Program in the region supports around 18 to 20 million people with food assistance, be in kind or cash transfers, depending on the functioning of the markets. Uh, and at this moment, we continue working in Zimbabwe. We are in Zimbabwe at this moment working with the uh, project Lean Season that is supporting the people who are affected by the big droughts, the last three, three years droughts. Uh, 4.1 million people have been supported in Zimbabwe uh, with World Food, Food Program. And they are not uh, only rural populations, they are also urban populations in eight urban centers who are doing cash transfers as well. So basically, for us, uh, it's very, very critical to maintain that. And the only way to maintain is getting permissions from governments. And uh, in this case, let me explain you very rapidly what we have done. Over the last week before South Africa closed, uh, it went to lockdown, we requested the South African government, a sort of like humanitarian corridor, allow the vessels to land, that land in Durban to be offloaded and be moved to the, to the different countries, the commodities allow the suppliers in South Africa who are producing nutritious foods and maize meal for other countries in the region to continue providing so their workers can work and they can continue providing World Food Program, the food to move across and allow also the borders and this cargo to move across the borders. And I must report that at this moment, we have been almost seven days in lockdown and we have seen no no problems. Our food continues moving in South Africa and to the other countries in the region, to Namibia, Botswana, uh, to Zimbabwe, to Zambia, to every country, and also from other countries like Mozambique continue moving into Zimbabwe, Malawi into Zimbabwe as well. Just to let you know that this is working well, but we really need to maintain it. And maybe at this moment, we are only maintaining our, our actual normal distributions, but maybe in the future, depending on the effect of the virus, and the effect on the food systems, especially on the smallholder farmers that may have problems to access their fields, to have um, access to markets, to be able to sell their products, maybe we'll see an increase of prices and an increase of number of people who will require food assistance. At this moment, we're just asking for the donors to give us $413 million to be able to buy the food on time, now that harvest is coming, to be able to distribute in the next three months on time. We have also changed the modality of distributions. We have implemented uh, physical distancing. We have implemented hand washing. We have uh, protected our humanitarian and workers and civil society workers who are working with the communities to protect everybody and do no harm during the distributions. That's also very critical. Thank you. Just a reminder before we go to Dr. Moetti for um, McDonald's other question, please use the Q&A function on the chat and we can read your question out. And if you can just tell us your name and, and your organization, that would be fantastic. Um, Dr. Moetti, just turning to you for the second part of McDonald's question uh, there. Okay, thank you. Uh, WHO has worked uh, very hard with governments to expand their capacity for, for testing. Working with partners like the Africa CDC, we've carried out training. We have helped procure testing equipment and also testing supplies, including lab kits. So for example, at the beginning of February, we only had two laboratories in the WHO Africa region, meaning Sub-Saharan Africa plus Algeria, which could confirm this virus. And now we have 43 countries that have this testing capacity. So it's been an very rapid expansion of this testing capacity. The availability of testing kits is a big challenge at the global level, and I'm sure you're following all the discussions about that on the international media. I do think though that uh, in the early part of the outbreak, we had, and we continue to see, quite a large number of alerts and people who have uh, symptoms suggesting they might have COVID-19 being tested. So. My sense is that from the, the functioning of the surveillance system, the alert system and the testing and discarding of some of the potential cases that we are seeing clearly not 100% of all the people who are infected. But I do not think that there are large numbers of people who are infected asymptomatic and the systems are not able to detect them. We would of course like to encourage a more active approach to testing as well as undertaken, for example, in a country like South Korea, so that it's possible to 
though early, even including when people are asymptomatic, who might be who might be infected? In some countries, some zero surveys are being carried out, so that the interventions of physical distancing, contact tracing, um, quarantining such people, and limiting onward transmission from them can be put in place. And here, there is a real challenge of the availability of test kits. We're working very hard with uh, WHO headquarters, partners like UNICEF, and others to source whatever is available and also working, for example, from my headquarters with the Chinese government, asking them to support and to encourage their manufacturers to increase their production of these kits and make them available through WHO and other partners to African countries. So it's a recognized challenge. It's something on which we are working with our logistics teams and our partners every day, because it's a very important part of the intervention of identifying cases tracing contacts and limiting the spread of the virus. A uh, question from Neil Munchi, uh, West Africa Bureau Chief of the FT, who's based in Lagos in Nigeria. Um, and Neil asks, what can or will African governments do to make up for their lack of ventilators and ICU beds? And uh, given that likely there's a lack of those facilities, does this mean that mortality rates will likely be higher and finally, he asks, what explains the very low number of cases so far in Africa relative to other regions? Um, is it perhaps related to the age structure of Africa's population? Um, Dr. Mweti, perhaps you and your colleagues could, uh, could address those questions from Neil. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll ask Dr. Zabulo Nyoti to start answering the question of um, treatment capacity in Africa and, and probable mortality rates. Thank you. We, we have seen globally the need for expanding the treatment capacity in, in relation to severe cases and also those cases who, who need to be treated from ICU. And uh, what we notice is a small percentage of people also from the data available about uh, one to two percent will need ventilators and also about 15 percent may need ICU. Uh, the health systems in Africa, as we, you may all be aware, before the COVID well was already a bit weak with minimum supply of some of these facilities, ICU and, uh, and ventilators. We are at the moment working with the countries to estimate these needs. We have done some modeling and uh, we are finalizing those scenarios. And we are also collecting information from each of the countries based on the scenarios to estimate the real needs of ventilators. But we do recognize that there are gaps in health systems, including really availability of the ICU beds and ventilators. Concerning the mortality, the limited data we have for Africa we have looked at, and we do see that uh, the, like the global picture, we have so far had, of course, 100 and 25 deaths reported out of around 4,000 cases reported from the 47 countries in the region. They, we have also noticed that the deaths do occur not only in elderly, we have actually seen some cases where people less than 40 have died as well. And also people with the, some other comorbidities like we have seen globally uh, having higher mortality, but of course, we have to uh, interpret this data with a caution because we still have uh, small numbers. Concerning the increases, whether we are really uh, uh, counting all cases, we have seen, of course, in the last few days, a drastic increase, big increase in number of cases confirmed in various countries. And uh, over 10 days, we have seen this number actually sometimes triple. So we think that our capacity to detect the cases contributes to this, good surveillance contributes to this, but also we, we uh, think that the, uh, the real spread of this disease is being reflected by this increase in number of cases. Merci beaucoup. Et on voudrait peut-être aussi demander à, à Dr. Yao uh, un peu la même question, mais aussi on a reçu des questions des, des journalistes uh, francophones qui nous demandent en fait euh, on voit que le nombre de cas est encore relativement bas euh, dans plusieurs pays euh, africains. On a évidemment des mesures de confinement, 
Mais au-delà euh, de, de, de ça, est-ce qu'on peut euh, trouver des autres mesures qui, qui peuvent être mises en place et qui sont peut-être mieux euh, adaptées à la situation africaine On a parlé de, de la jeunesse de la population africaine. Il y a un journaliste notamment qui, qui demande, Dr Roger Moyou Mogo, euh, de, euh, de Canal+, si on peut faire, par exemple, en isolation plutôt des, des personnes âgées, euh, les gens euh, de, qui ont plus de 70 ans, par exemple, euh, et ou bien il y a un autre journaliste qui, qui, qui demande euh, les mesures d'hygiène, est-ce euh, que ce serait suffisant ou est-ce qu'on doit vraiment aller partout euh, à des mesures de confinement, encore une fois, dans le contexte, et peut-être vous pouvez aussi nous donner un peu plus d'infos, euh, dans le contexte de, de nombre de cas qui est assez relativement bas encore dans plusieurs pays africains. De Dr Yao. Merci beaucoup. Le nombre de cas en, en Afrique, en, en fait, progresse rapidement. Si on regarde ce qui s'est passé en, en Chine ou en Europe, on a d'abord une progression relativement lente et puis on passe très rapidement à une augmentation exponentielle. On a vu que les 26, derniers, les 26 premiers jours, euh, dès le, les premiers cas en Afrique, euh, on était autour de 1000 cas et ce chiffre en, en l'espace de 10 jours a été multiplié pratiquement par 4. Et donc, on avance vers une augmentation exponentielle. C'est un peu la tendance habituelle de cette épidémie, euh, notamment due au fait que les premiers cas ont été importés et maintenant on observe euh, une euh, augmentation, une multiplication de cas au niveau des communautés et c'est ce qui est d'ailleurs préoccupant. Donc ces chiffres pourraient augmenter très vite et cela nécessite qu'on mette en place des mesures. Quant aux mesures de confinement, ces mesures ne peuvent être efficaces que lorsqu'on se focalise sur l'objectif de ces confinements. L'objectif vise à aplatir, à ralentir un peu la croissance exponentielle pour augmenter la capacité de réponse, notamment une, un mécanisme de détection, même au sein des communautés, la confirmation et la capacité aussi d'isoler et de prendre en charge des cas. Donc, toute mesure de confinement doit avoir un corollaire de mesures de santé publique qui puissent permettre d'avancer dans le, le même sens. Par rapport à l'âge de la population, cela pourrait être un atout par, parce que les observations faites dans les situations actuelles montrent que les personnes âgées pourraient être beaucoup plus vulnérables en termes de gravité de cette maladie. Cependant, cela pourrait être nuancé en Afrique. Nous avons une forte prévalence aussi du VIH sida dans certains pays. Nous avons aussi le facteur de malnutrition qui prévaut aussi dans certains pays qui font face à l'insécurité alimentaire. Nous avons aussi la prévalence du tubec, de la tuberculose. Et donc, c'est des facteurs qui, combinés, pourraient ne pas forcément donner l'avantage à la jeunesse de la population en Afrique pour laquelle il faut Thank you for that. Um, we, can go, we can go to Uganda now and to Esther uh, Nakatsi. What, what are they saying? And Esther, can we uh, take your question, please? We're just going to unmute Esther so that we can hear her question. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks, Esther. Go ahead. Okay, this is Esther Nakazi from Uganda. And my question is about um, research in uh, Africa. What is the WHO take on research in Africa? What, what is being done for research participants? What are the recommendations that they are putting in place for research sites that had participants going on? And what are they doing about, are they giving, okay. Are they giving countries advice uh, uh, that is for all countries or are they taking, are they giving recommendations for each country uh, independently or are they letting the countries take their decisions on their own in terms of research and research uh, participants that were in uh, clinical trials? Thank you for that question. 
turning to Dr. Moetti and her colleagues to perhaps give you an answer on that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, WHO is working with other major supporters of research and countries and research, um, if you like, experts and institutes in, 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 in the countries to coordinate uh, participation and countries joining some of the, the clinical trials that are ongoing. So we, there is, there is a, a clinical trial, if you like, platform called Solidarity, which is uh, testing um, some therapeutics, including hydroxychloroquine and others, and combinations both for treatment and for prophylaxis among healthcare workers, which in which countries are being invited to, to join so that we can have a larger number of, 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 uh, of subjects which are, being, which are being studied in order to provide the data that's required. So this, I'm aware, is there's a, a big attempt to coordinate this, to put together all the capacities. A little bit, having learned from the experience of the Ebola uh, experimental drugs and the Ebola vaccine. So the, the research that is going on, there is a big attempt to coordinate it so that uh, similar methodologies can be applied and we can then benefit from having used the same way of uh, doing the research to be able to analyze it and learn and use the data and interpret it and then take decisions in terms of policy for treatment, for example, all together. This is what I'm aware that WHO is doing with, with, with various partners. So it's very much a matter of putting information out there that this study is ongoing and asking governments, countries and researchers uh, to join this effort. I don't know if my colleagues have any further information to provide, but it's very much an attempt to coordinate this. Of course, if countries want to carry out the research, I suppose they're free to do so. We recommend very strongly using the same protocols and approaches. The situation is changing quickly. At the moment, the numbers of subjects are small so that we can really facilitate common learning and common policy development out of these studies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two questions coming up from Zimbabwe. Uh, one is directed at the WHO. The other um, from Ish Mafundikwa is directed at the World Food Programme. Go to the first question. We've got privilege, Ms. Van Heeri from Deutsche Welle in Zimbabwe. And can we just cut up to uh, privilege, please, for her question? for his question. And we'll need to unmute the microphone in order to hear. Fingers crossed, we can get that slight technical. Okay, so we're gonna, um, if we can move on to uh, Ish Mafundikwa. Um, and just see if we can get Ish on the line from Zimbabwe, who has a question for the World Food Program. Just checking to see if that connection works. Thanks for bearing with us. It's, uh, as you can imagine, connectivity is, is difficult mm -hmm. for all our callers. So we appreciate your patience in uh, staying with us. Okay, don't think we're gonna get to either of them quite yet. Um, just reading Privilege's question here, uh, Privilege is asking if there's concern that African governments are not being entirely truthful on the statistics relating to infections. What's the uh, WHO's take on that? How confident are you in the statistics you're seeing coming out of governments? Dr. Moetti. Thank you. Um, on the whole, our country teams are working very closely with the ministries of health on surveillance. And <clears throat> of course, initially this might, it might take uh, some days for us to be well established for the, the information to be shared with, with WHO. We, you know, all countries virtually in our region are signatories of the international health regulations. So we remind them periodically that this is both a protection for them because it requires all countries to share information with WHO to enable 
the international spread of disease to be to be prevented and limited working jointly <clears throat> is also a responsibility for them to themselves share their own information as early as possible in as much detail as is possible so that we can support the analysis of this data to enable countries to to then shape their strategies of limiting the spread so this is a very important tool and platform that we remind uh, governments about and uh, ensure that they understand that it is a collective tool for collective benefit because if we know what's actually happening together we can work together to intervene and this is for the interests of the country affected but also for the neighboring countries so that some of the measures that are being undertaken now border closures etc might be minimized if we are sharing information openly if your neighbor knows what is your situation and contiguous districts for example can work together in order to limit the spread of disease together so the ihr of course we work uh, as i said on a day-to-day -day basis with, with governments we encourage them but they have an obligation in line with the international health regulations to openly share information and this is something about which we remind them as well Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from Zimbabwe, again from uh, Ish Mafandikwa, and this question is directed to Lola Castro. Ish, you can go ahead and ask your question. Just trying to see if we can get your connection a little bit better. hoping that we can do that. No, we're struggling with both both of those connections, I think. No, not going to quite make it. But um, Isha's question uh, for, for you, Lola Castro, in Johannesburg is Zimbabwe has a very high number of food insecure people that are being fed by the World Food Programme. Is there a plan to help daily wage earners who can't work because of the COVID-19 lockdown? A good question. At this moment, as I said before, we plan to continue what we are doing at this moment, that is reaching 4.1 million people in Zimbabwe. Uh, that's all out of the 7.7 .7 million who are food insecure this year, according to analysis. Uh, These 4.1 million are in both uh, eight urban areas, uh, which are Harare, Mashvingo, others, as well as uh, the rural areas of the country. The issue of um, urban workers, we have not yet been requested to, but for welfare program, we will focus most not on the real socioeconomic status at this moment, but on the vulnerability or the inability of people to access food and the request from the different actors or the assessment. So at this moment, we are not, but uh, obviously we are open like, um, uh, I must say, for example, in, uh, in the Republic of Congo, where Dr. Moeti and her team are, are sitting, after the lockdown, we received a request and uh, 20,000 vulnerable people in uh, Brazzaville will start receiving some support from the World Food Program. And this is a new program related to the COVID-19 lockdown that is leaving people more vulnerable and unable to access the food they need every day. Thank you very much. And I think we can go to Ashish uh, Cool. Ashish, do we have you on the line? Hi, can you hear me? Great, can you just tell us where you're dialing in from and, uh, and your news organization? Well, I'm dialing in from uh, Mozambique and uh, I would love, my question is to all the panelists, uh, anybody who can answer this. Uh, uh, is this true that the trend of uh, what we've been seeing, I saw a document from uh, WHO saying that the malaria affected countries where the malaria is there, they are less prone to have the COVID virus. <laughs> okay, thanks for that question. Dr. Moeti uh, and, and colleagues, is there any evidence that you're seeing that um, malaria affected countries are less um, prone to COVID-19 infection? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid we do not have any such observation. Some of the countries where we are seeing cases expanding in Nigeria, in uh, Senegal, are countries where we have uh, malaria significantly. 
in, in, in Burkina Faso as well. So I'm afraid not. Merci. Et on voudrait aussi poser une question euh, de Falila Gbada Massi, qui travaille pour France Télévisions, euh, évidemment en France, à Paris. Et il demande, y a-t-il des pistes pour soigner la maladie euh, coronavirus ou la mal maladie liée au cor coronavirus du côté des tradipraticiens africains, à l'instar de ce qui est fait dans la médecine traditionnelle chinoise, parce qu'on entend qu'en euh, Chine, on a fait euh, des, des, ou on a essayé de faire de la médecine traditionnelle chinoise pour euh, résoudre euh, les maladies liées au coronavirus. Est-ce que, euh, est que ce serait aussi possible pour les tradipraticiens africains ou non pas Peut-être on, on demande au euh, docteur Yao d'intervenir. Merci beaucoup. Um, ce sont des pistes qui sont uh, explorées et en ce moment, nous travaillons à ce que, au niveau de uh, la plupart des pays, qu'il y ait des équipes de recherche et donc des équipes de recherche uh, qui peuvent uh, uh, en fait mettre l'accent sur toutes ces possibilités uh, thérapeutiques, bien sûr, en respectant uh, un certain protocole avec uh, l'approbation de différents comités d'éthique. La difficulté en Afrique autour de ces médicaments euh, dits traditionnels, c'est la définition claire de la posologie, euh, euh, l'analyse des effets secondaires qui peuvent en, en découler, mais ce sont des pistes qui sont à explorer et d'ailleurs dans la sensibilisation, parce que euh, c'est le premier recours pour plusieurs Africains dans la sensibilisation, ce sont des groupes que les équipes cibles pour sensibiliser, pour mieux comprendre la maladie et aussi orienter les personnes qui sollicitent leurs services. Mais c'est des pistes à explorer avec des équipes de recherche africaines que nous essayons de motiver et de mettre en place. Vous avez des conseils pour, ce qui, pour ceux qui aident, cherchent de l'aide maintenant parce que vous avez dit on explore ah oui, pour ceux qui cherchent de l'aide maintenant, comme je dis, il n'y a pas d'évidence. C'est la difficulté avec la médecine traditionnelle. C'est pour cela que sensibiliser ceux qui donnent ces services pour que dans ce cas d'une maladie qui est méconnue, même s'il si y a des symptômes qui ressemblent à la grippe, qu'ils puissent orienter des malades vers les structures de santé qui ont la capacité de détection et qui peuvent mettre en place en fait, faire face à, à, à l'aggravation lorsque on a des cas qui évoluent vers l'aggravation. Donc, c'est encore tout nouveau, c'est pratiquement méconnu de, de, de la médecine traditionnelle. Ça nécessite d'être exploré avec des mécanismes de recherche et avec des groupes de recherche africains. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Yao. OK, we have a question from Juanita Williams at allafrica.com uh, for Lola Castro at the WFP. And Juanita says, uh, the WFP is clearly concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on food security. What can governments do to support small-scale farmers and small-scale food producers? Uh, Lola Castro. Mm, a very important question because, as we know, most of the food produced in Africa is produced by smallholder farmers, and many of them are women. And, and the, their livelihoods, their daily life depends on what they produce, they bring to the markets. And, and what can they sell on a daily basis sometimes. So it's critical that uh, we ensure that those producers can continue producing. And uh, for that, we need to make sure that the seeds are moving still and they can be planted, that the transport, a small transport, as well as the big, uh, over the big haulers, transporters can move in the countries and that some markets remain open, obviously respecting all the distancing and all the mm, health recommendations from WHO. But it is extremely important for both, for the smallholder farmers to continue producing as well as for the public who have access only to these small producers' commodities to maintain the supply chains open. This, uh, our recommendation will be really to the governments to look at this sector very carefully to ensure that not only the big producers but the small Uh, households who depend on the daily production and daily access to the markets remain open and continue able to feed Africa and feed especially the area of Southern Africa where we have many, many of these being women 
who are vulnerable women and will not be able even themselves to provide food security for their families if they are not able to produce and sell. Thank you. Very direct question from uh, Ruth McLean of the New York Times based in Senegal, uh, directed at Dr. Moeti and colleagues. Um, Ruth McLean asks, how many ventilators are there in the whole of Africa? Is that a statistic that you have um, an estimation or an exact figure for, uh, Dr. Moeti and colleagues? Um, I think at the moment we're trying to find out this, this information from, from our country-based colleagues in order to know for the region. So we don't have the actual number. I think what we can say without any doubt is that the, there is an enormous gap in the numbers of ventilators needed in African countries for this uh, COVID outbreak as we see the evolution of cases, as we see the number of countries where there is local transmission, geographic spread within the countries. And as this happens in the context of a global shortage and lockdowns that will make uh, transportation of these ventilators a challenge. So I think what this tells us, we are working with our colleagues now to find out the actual information and to carry out projections of the probable number of cases that will occur in different circumstances in different countries and therefore estimate what gap there will be. At the same time as we work with our partners on trying to find ways to source this type of uh, equipment and very importantly also plan for how to have transportation arranged for the procured uh, ventilators when both the countries ourselves and our partners find them and to get them into countries getting the permission that's needed by the governments to enable these sorts of deliveries to happen. So it is, it is certainly an area of, of a great challenge in African countries coming since in the majority of countries the numbers are still small, but we have seen how it has been one of the biggest challenges that uh, more developed countries with more resources are facing. And we have a question from uh, Bronwyn Nielsen of Nielsen Network in South Africa, who asks, are we any closer to understanding the risks of reinfection? Um, Dr. Moeti, again, um, perhaps one of your colleagues might like to weigh in on that. Okay, Zabilon, perhaps you might like to, to respond to that. Yeah, sure. The, the reinfection, we have uh, no concrete evidence from the uh, African region here. We have seen from literature and they're also not fully verified what's happening in other countries, especially China, but we are keen, keenly looking at what is happening in Africa. So for now, we don't have concrete evidence of reinfection. Merci. Et on voulait aussi vous demander encore une fois, on a entendu dans la réponse avant, qu'il y a un manque mondial de ventilateurs et qu'il y a un écart euh, dans le nombre qui est disponible en Afrique et du nombre dont on a besoin. Comment voyez-vous la possibilité d'en obtenir euh, dans, dans ce contexte euh, d'un manque mondial des ventilateurs et Ok, je vais demander à Dr. Yao de, de répondre à cette question. Michel, s'il vous plaît. Um, merci beaucoup. Uh, L'utilisation des ventilateurs est essentielle par rapport à l'expérience uh, en Chine et en, en Europe pour limiter le, le nombre de décès, surtout des cas critiques et des cas euh, sévères. Mais ce sont des, des équipements qui euh, ne se fabriquent pas en Afrique, pour lesquels l'approvisionnement se fait sur le marché international, euh, sur lequel euh, les demandes sont euh, énormes. Euh, ce que nous sollicitons, et c'est ce qui se discute, je pense que cela s'est discuté au G20 aussi, c'est qu'il puisse avoir euh, une sorte de solidarité. On sait que les besoins sont énormes. Euh, il y a des pays qui, euh, en ce moment, ont plus de 3000 patients en soins intensifs. Et donc, cela euh, montre un peu l'ampleur de la demande. Cela pourrait être la même chose pour l'Afrique si la situation euh, se dégrade. Donc, sans un mécanisme de solidarité, il serait difficile. L'OMS, bien sûr, travaille avec... Euh, les industries manufacturières pour euh, pouvoir stocker des stocks en main si ces stocks-là ne sont pas répartis 
euh, avec euh, une certaine solidarité vers l'Afrique, il serait difficile à l'Afrique, ne serait-ce qu'avoir le minimum pour limiter le nombre de décès qui pourraient être liés à des cas graves. Thank you very much. Um, probably time for just a couple more questions. Do we have Elizabeth Marab from the Nation Media in Kenya on the line? If we do, if we can bring Elizabeth up. We're just checking that connection now, seeing if we can go to Elizabeth in Nairobi. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see you. Go Great. Ahead. <laughs> uh, so I have a couple of questions, but the first one is about uh, the genetic sequence. We haven't got long, so if they can be very concise, that would be great. Great. Uh, has any African country posted the genetic sequence of the COVID-19 circulating in Africa? I understand Nigeria had something, but uh, I'd like uh, a concrete answer on that. And then uh, uh, there, are, there is news that uh, there are eight strains of COVID circulating across the globe. Is this true? And the final question is on BCG. Um, there are scientific papers that I've seen that suggest that uh, because Africa has had a lot of uh, immunization drives and uh, uh, a lot of Africans are vaccinated against tuberculosis using the BCG vaccine, they, uh, it may be contributing to the lower numbers that we're seeing in Africa. Is this the case? Okay, three good questions. Dr. Mwaki and colleagues. Um, thank you. I think I'll, I'll ask Dr. Yoti to respond to the genetic sequencing question, in fact, to the series of questions. Yeah, thank you. We uh, do know that there were two laboratories in uh, South Africa, the NICD and Institute Pasteur Dakar uh, in Senegal do have the capacity to do sequencing. And uh, I'm sure additional labs, including those in Nigeria and so on, would be able to have that capacity. But for now, uh, to answer your question, we do not have this data of Africa on genetic sequencing, but we are looking forward to really doing that important work you have highlighted. And then on the vaccination for TB, the BCG, there is currently no evidence that BCG works and protects against COVID-19. There's a lot of information uh, in social media about many things and that my advice will be stick to, let's stick to the credible source of information because some of this may actually divert the attention for, from concentrating on physical distancing, on hand washing, and then making sure that surveillance is done to pick cases early and identify contacts and trace and monitor them. So the credible source of information will be really advisable. She asked a question about eight strains of the COVID-19 in Africa. I, I think that we are not aware of this information, but we can, we can look, we can go and search the literature and see where there might be some discussion of this. I, I'm personally not aware of, of any discussion of so many different things. Of it. <laughs> Thank you both for, for that. Um, we're, we're down to our last couple of minutes on this briefing call. Very, very quickly, I just want to take one more question to both Dr. Moetti and, uh, and uh, Ms. Castro. Uh, it's a question from the East Africa correspondent of the German press agency based in Kenya, Zhao Forster. And the question really is, what's the best chance that African countries have to get the spread of COVID-19 and the economic damage under control? Is it large-scale testing? Is it lockdowns like European and Asian countries? Or is there a different route that African countries should take? Really very sort of brief headline thought from, from both of you as we uh, run down the clock. Uh, Dr. Moetti first, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a combination of, of, of ways of approaching this. First, I think it's very rigorous, meticulous application of the public health measures that we have talked about. So the case identification, that means testing, contact tracing immediately, uh, quarantining and isolation of these people and limiting the spread because in quite a few cases we still have only imported cases and this is important for us to to understand and then secondly I think it's very much um, intense uh, community engagement and community information and in a sense making people feel empowered and confident in how they can 
uh, take action to protect themselves as opposed to being the subjects of impositions of rules by government. So people must know in detail what are the hygienic measures, the, the distancing measures that they are able to take, that they can take. And then thirdly, it's governments making the, and working with partners, providing what is needed for all of this to be realistic for people, to be feasible, including mitigating the, the, the impact of some of the limitations we, of movement that we, that we imposed. Thank you so much. That's great advice. And we've run out of time. Thanks to everyone for joining. And I uh, hope this was a, uh, a useful and informative briefing. Thank you all. À la semaine prochaine. Thank you Merci. very much. Thank you.